Okay, now we are recording. So, okay. So, so like I said before, the, the midterm will cover everything we have learned until the end of next week. Make sure you're clear about it. Uh, we will have a review, and you'll have to you know. Now, I encourage you to ask questions and ask questions now, early on. And then after fall break, we'll go into uh, 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 some details on a few other things like radiometry and so on. Then we'll also start working on the commercialization. So. We're going to pretty much follow the schedule. Things might change a little bit, but more or less it's the same. Uh, just keep in mind your next assignment is due in about a month. So you probably should start thinking about that. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, uh, on Thursday after all your presentations. Okay, so are there any questions, first of all, about your assignment one? Or everyone's pretty clear what to do? Have uh, orders for the presentation. I'll just pick random. Yeah, just random number generator. Matlab. Okay, so today we'll uh, begin uh, non imaging optics. So, uh, this is the lecture, right? So, we have looked at uh, geometrical optics so far. So, let's think about what that means and what non imaging optics means. So, that's the real intuitive thing that I want you to get out of it. So, so first, what is imaging optics? And you've seen this in the last few uh, lectures on geometrical optics. Imaging optics essentially means you have some black box, some optical system. It can be one lens, it can be a thousand lenses, whatever, I mean, depending on the complexity of the system. But you're essentially taking an object and forming an image of the object. If you think about what this means is that you, what you're saying is, all the rays that come from one point P of this object goes in all directions. Okay, the rays, like emitting in all directions. It may not, but in general, it's going in all directions. You collect as much rays as you can, and all those rays essentially go to another point P prime of the image. Okay? So what's critical here is that there is a one-to-one -one mapping that's happening. P goes to P prime. There's a unique one-to-one -one mapping. That's the important thing from an imaging optics point of view, imaging system point of view. Okay? Uh, but in non-imaging optics, such a one-to-one -one mapping is not required. That is a key idea. It's a key concept that everything else will rely upon. So in other words, if you think about a non-imaging optics, you have a light source, like the sun, for example. You have some optics, and you have a receiver. Okay? So there is no image that's formed. There is no one-to-one -one mapping. Typically what happens, not always, you basically have a one-to-many mapping. But not always. You can have many-to-many -many mapping and things like that. And we'll talk about this. Okay? So in non-imaging optics, the goal is to create a desired irradiance on the receiver so the energy transfer is the most important thing, not forming a good image. Okay? The irradiance on the receiver for a given light source. There is no one-to-one -one mapping of the points of the source to those on the receiver. So that's a key idea. Okay, so now let's think again a little bit about how using optics works. So let's take two, uh, three points of an object. So the object is uh, noted as E, F. I need to get new batteries. Uh, okay, so I'll use the mouse. So the, the object is shown as EF. A point F goes to point F prime, uh, sorry, goes to point A. Point E is mapped to point B, and point P is mapped to point Q. Okay, so that's again one to one mapping. Each point on the object gets mapped to each point on the, uh, your unique point on the image. Now, of course, there are a few important things. You can think about this as concentration, for example, just from the way I've drawn it. You've taken a big object, formed a small image. Okay? This is, for example, what happens when you take a picture with a camera. Right? You take a big scene and try to uh, concentrate it onto a small sensor. So it is concentration, but in addition to concentration, it's also doing imaging. It's forming a good image. Right? And in that case, you have 
what's called a magnification, in this case, B magnification in the case of concentration, where M magnification factor is less than one. Okay, it can be larger than one. In the case of a microscope, this is the opposite, right? You have a small object, you magnify it so your eye can see it. The magnification factor is larger than one. And I think you talked about this in the geometric optics lectures. Okay, so the size of the image is M times the size of the object. Now, design, if you think about designing using systems with lenses, from a very, very general point of view, I know you went through some of the details in the geometric lens, but think it from a very general point of view. What you're really trying to do is, again, en enable this one-to-one -one mapping. So you want to map, again, from P to a point Q. All the rays from P, you want to end up converging into Q. Now, and let's ignore everything else on, this, on the object. Just concentrate on just one point P, okay? Now, we can define a surface. Imagine you are able to design one surface, basically, to do this. You know Snell's law, you know refraction. You can draw any ray there. Okay, you can draw any, any ray here, and then you can draw a normal to the surface, and you can let it refract following Snell's law. Right? You can do that by hand, ray tracing, basically. Now, what is the requirement that makes it such that all the rays that come from one point converge to the image point. And the requirement is a very important condition, which we won't prove. Uh, I think you might have uh, touched on this in the geometric optics class, is that the optical path of all the rays from one point to the uh, one point on the object to its corresponding point on the image must be the same. Okay? In other words, if I take a ray, which is shown here, P to R to Q. Let's say that's the way diffraction, uh, the refraction works in the case of Snell's law. It doesn't really matter exactly what it is. That distance D happens in air, refractive index of 1. Okay? And let's say all of this is glass. I'm forming a point image in glass. All of this happens in, with refractive index of N then you're also traveling a distance d1. The optical path length of that ray is defined as d times 1, the refractive index in air, plus d1 multiplied by n, the refractive index in class. OK, let me repeat that again. This is an important idea to keep in mind. So if you follow a ray from a point p, this ray, it's traveling through air over a distance d. So the path, path length here is d, because the refractive index is 1 in air. Okay? Optical path length is different than physical path length, the so physical length. That's what I want you to appreciate. Then, after refraction, it goes from r to q, it passes through a physical length of d1, but because it's in glass, the optical path length is d1 multiplied by n. So the optical path length is d plus n times d1. OK? By the way, I will explain to you why that is the case in a, in a, in a minute. But let's go continue this argument first, uh, this, this thought process first. Then if I take another ray, Let's say I take this ray, the one that goes straight, capital D. Okay? So it goes through a distance of capital D in air. And then, because it's normal to the surface, it doesn't do anything. Right? It goes straight through. Snell's law, theta is 0, sine 0 equals it's 0 on incident angle 0. Or the refracted angle is also 0. It goes straight through. And let's say it goes through a distance of D1, physical distance of D1 to Q. What the principle says of constant optical path length is that small d plus small d1 times n should be equal to capital D plus capital D1 times n, which is shown here. Okay? That is the condition to ensure that the rays from one point converge to a rays to another point. And you showed this with matrix optics in the geometric optics class, if I remember right. Did you? 
optical pattern. You talked about optical pattern. You talked about the imaging condition, how an image is formed. Exactly the same thing. Mathematically, conceptually, everything. So, so think about the imaging condition. Uh, one over the object distance equals one over the image. One over the object distance plus one over the image distance equals one over the focal length. It is equivalent to what I'm saying here. Okay, I'm not going to prove it mathematically, but it is equivalent. Okay, and we'll, we'll come back to this in a second. Now, before uh, before I go any further, I need some markers. Can you grab some? I, uh, yeah. I want to explain to you why the optical path length is important. But so the goal here. To think about it, is I want to design that shape of this, what can be thought of as a, this, this surface, such that I want to be able to take all the rays that come from one point and shape it such that all the rays that refract after that surface end up on another point. So that's the goal. Okay. So in other words, I want to be able to take all any ray that comes here, but shape this such that it bends to the same point. That's what we'll come to in the next slide. But before we do that, and that's the whole idea of what's called the Cartesian oval, it's a surface such that each point on it has only one ray of light from P. So what that means is that if I take every point here, if I draw it, start drawing rays actually, let me do that first. So let's draw the optical axis first. And let's take a point, let's draw the optical axis for simplicity, okay, and let's just draw rays. Arbitrarily, right? Goes in all directions, let's say. Then I have another point here, which is my image. Okay, so I want to make sure that all rays end up there. So first of all, I need to define the surface. So let's say I miss this. Okay, that's too big. Okay, I take this and let's start some point here. So this point I have to define a surface now, such so that the ray goes this way. So I want to send the ray this way. What would I do? I need to define something, so some interface. Right? So in other words, if I want to bend the light this way, uh, let's let's make a guess. Okay, it would be something like this. So the way I would do it is to draw it carefully. I have to draw a normal to the surface, and then I have an incident angle, and I have a refracted angle. I haven't drawn it right, but you can imagine. Right? And I satisfy Snell's law. And I can move this surface, this I can move this normal, rotate it like this until I get the ray going where I want. Okay, can you see that? It's important that you visualize that. So, so I'm basically taking that surface and tilting it until I know the ray is going the right way. This is fine, this is determined. You're not changing that, you're only changing this. If I take this and tilt it, it's going to tilt. So tilt it that way, it's going to tilt. Okay? And that defines the normal. I can do that for every ray. So I can go down here, do the same thing. So I could have a different surface. Right? This one, I don't have to do anything. I know it has to be normal. And then I do something here. Just like it goes this way. Something here goes this way. And so on. This is gone. And then you connect all these points together. You get what's the, called the Cartesian. Oh, and we'll see exactly what this is in a second. So that's the mechanism. Okay. Now, uh, before we go further, let's talk about what the optical path like this and, and why it's important. So the reason optical path like this is important, if you look, uh, let's think about light traveling as a plane wave. Okay. So there are a bunch of waves <coughs> traveling in air. Now, if you look at this exact same wave in glass, it will look different because this is the wavelength of light. These are what are called wave fronts. Okay, these are the technically these can be thought of. Can you see? Uh, these can be thought of as surfaces of constant phase. Not so important for us, but basically you can think about a plane. Okay, this is like the light from the sun, just at one wave. This. 
distance between these wave fronts is the wavelength. Now, imagine what happens in glass, the exact same wave. Can anyone tell me? Let's start at the same location. So what will this be in glass? Where will the next? It slows down. It slows down, exactly. But go ahead, yeah, you are going to see. Will it be further away or closer together? What happens to lambda? Go back, think about our constituent relations in electromagnetics. We talked about it in our second lecture, I believe. What happens to lambda? The glass refractive index is n. Air refractive index n equals 1, let's say. This is n, let's say, is 1.5. It doesn't matter, whatever. Lambda is going to what? Lambda is going to be bigger. Okay, let's think about that for a second. The, the, again, you don't need to memorize these. I want you to understand these conceptually. The energy of the photon is given by H times nu, right? Planck's constant times frequency, which is the same as H C over lambda. Remember, the constituent relation is that nu times lambda equals C, the velocity of light. Right? So I can simply put that in there and I get that. Now, whether the photon is in air or it's in glass, it doesn't matter. The energy is the same, right? Just because it's in glass, it's not because it doesn't say you have more energy. That's impossible, right? That will break the conservation of energy. So the energy is exactly the same of this and this. Now, what that means is that H is a Planck's constant. That cannot change, right? It's the same. That means frequency doesn't change. It's fixed. The frequency of the wave, whether I look in air or in glass, is exactly <coughs> the same also, right? Look at this equation. If energy is constant, H is constant, nu has to be constant, right? Cannot change. Okay? Now let's go to this equation. Okay? Nu is constant, cannot change. But something has happened, right? It has slowed down. C has changed. Not gone faster, it has slowed down. Okay? How much? By n. Okay? So, of course, on this side also you have to divide by n. Okay, which means that the wavelength has decreased. So nu times lambda equals c is a fundamental relation. It's always true. But keep in mind that <coughs> lambda depends on what material you're in. You c depends on what material you're in. Nu does not. It's constant. It depends on the energy of the photon. Other than that, it's constant. Okay? Is that intuitively clear? Uh, mathematically clear. Intuitively, you have to visualize what that means. You have a question? Yeah. For reality, if you were mm -hmm. a wave propagated to the glass, is it going to lose energy? If there is no absorption in the glass, no. No loss. There's maybe <laughs> reflection. I don't know, but imagine our whole universe is glass. No interface. We'll come to reflection and so on. I mean, you already talked about this, yes. I, I'm th for, forget everything. Uh, just think about two scenarios. One, everything is in air. One, everything is in glass. So t now, OK, everyone kind of mathematically at least appreciates this. Now tell me where, so wavelength is smaller. It has shrunk. So where should the next wave front be? Closer together, right? So it will be, let's say, down here. 50% closer, let's say. It's lambda over it. Okay. Okay. So it, what this means is that if I take a look at the same physical space, D, in air, I have one, two, three, four waves, uh, one, two, three waves in air. But I could have one, two, three, four, five waves in glass. Okay? So what, how much light has traveled depends not just on physical space, but it depends on what material it's traveling in. Okay? If you are a beam of light, you could have traveled three wavelengths in air. 
But if you were in glass, you would have traveled five wavelengths. Okay? That's why optical path is different than physical path. So optical path is always the physical path D multiplied by the refractive index. Okay, so that's conceptually that's a way to think about it. Again, don't memorize any of this. Think, think. By the way, I forgot to mention that the exam is all open book. You don't need to memorize anything. Open internet. Okay? The only thing you can do is you cannot communicate with your neighbors. You can't text, call, otherwise it's not fair. But it's open everything. I mean, of course, you guys know that I don't give closed exams. I've never given closed exams. Doesn't make sense. Because in the real world, everything's open, right? You're trying to solve some problem. <laughs> Memorizing all this is nonsense. You need to understand, otherwise you're wasting your time. I mean, some memorization, of course. I'm, I'm exaggerating, obviously. Anyway. Okay, so assuming that the concept is correct, the conclusion from, that we need to draw from here is that with one surface that I can control, I'm able to take <coughs> rays from one point and allocate them to another point. Okay? And the question arises, what if I have another point P prime here? And I want to do the exact same thing. Okay, let's, let's try it. Okay, I've, I've already made a sur surface here. Right, I've already, because the, the rays are continuous, right? they're, not, they're not discrete, like I've drawn, they're continuous, they happen everywhere. So I have drawn a continuous surface here. So if I pick another point, I have no choice. It's not like I can change this. It's already chosen. I don't have a choice. <coughs> okay? It, it will do whatever it's supposed to do. What that means is that there is no way I can take another point and make a perfect image of that with one surface. So I don't have enough degree of control. Right? One surface is already defined. This will, this, the rays from here will do whatever they are supposed to do according to Snell's law, and which may not have anything to do with forming an image. Okay, so the conclusion from that very simple thought argument is that you need more than one surface to form the image of more than one point. I need one more surface. Okay, now I have two. Degrees of freedom, two constraints that I'm trying to meet. Conceptually speaking, mathematically, of course, you have more, you know, more things that you're trying to solve, but let's ignore that. So with two surfaces, it turns out that I can actually form two ideal images, point images. Okay, and that's the subject of the next slide. So for imaging two points, in this example, E and F, I need two surfaces. And this is a very simple example where you know each, each point here says that you refract here and you refract there. And you, so you have two points of refraction from for every single ray. And you can show that this applies now slot each of those two points across the surface, you are able to do this. So again, the, the principle of how you design the surface is exactly the same. Like we did, right? You just draw a bunch of rays, then you look at where they intersect that surface, and you tilt the surface until you get a particular angle, and then you tilt this surface and get the next angle, and so on and so forth. Of course, doing it by hand is is crazy. You would do it on a computer, basically, if you have to. Okay. And that's as complex as we will think about these surfaces. So two surfaces. Uh, can be designed such that two points are imaged, F to A and E to B. But the other, so again, then the other question is, what happens to other points? What if I have another point? No. What if I pick another? No luck. Right? The surface is already picked. I don't have a choice. Can't do anything. I need one more surface, and so on and so forth. This is the fundamental reason why. When you try to go by a very fancy SLR camera, it's expensive. 
plus thousand dollars or something compared to the little camera on your phone. And the reason is they go and design this series of surfaces very, very, very carefully and they make it very precisely grinding the lens and all that. That's the reason. Very fundamental. Now, of course, these things used to be done by hand. Nowadays, it's all computer. It's complicated. Get many surfaces. Okay. So then the question is, what happens if you don't have enough surfaces? Let's say you only have two surfaces and you need to form an image. You, you do form images. The point is that you form imperfect images, elaborations of them. So you take a picture with your cell phone. It doesn't look as nice as if you take a picture with your fancy SLR. That's one way to think about it. Okay. So real lenses always form imperfect images or images with aberrations. Okay, so for perfect imaging, under geometrical optics assumptions, one would need infinite surfaces or perfect control of refractive index. Not so important for us, but just something to know. Okay, now let's think about this problem from non-imaging optics. So that was imaging optics, right? You're trying to form good images. Now let's flip it around. Exact same system, two interfaces, like a lens, let's say. But I'm trying to just do non-imaging optics. What does that mean? What that means, okay, so, so from a big picture point of view, what that means is, okay, I'm going to take energy from a source, pass it through some lens as a concentrator, let's say, and put all that energy into a receiver. So that's what I'm, I want to do. Now, now what, uh, what helps us is, the, is this very simple fact, is that if we take edge points of the source, in this case E and F, that image, and we ensure that those surfaces, so remember what I said here, uh, to image two points, E and P prime, I can do it perfectly with two surfaces. Okay. Now if I ensure that the two points I choose are the two edge points of my source, let's say the sun, okay, then I can do that, right? I can make another image here that is theoretically ideal, okay, I can get all the rays to go to B prime, uh, sorry, Q prime, sorry. Then what, oh yeah, there is an eraser over there actually, thanks. Um, so what really helps us that if you are able to do that for those edge points, take the edge points of the source and make sure they go to the edge points of your receiver, what really helps you is the fact that every point in between from the source will end up with rays going to points in between on the receiver as well. So what that means is that uh, if, I'm going to draw my erase, these rays, make it simpler. But let's say I've designed this perfectly for these two points. If I take any arbitrary point in between, you know, it has all kinds of rays, goes everywhere. I can ensure that all the rays that are collected by this, by this lens or device, let's say. Of course, some rays escape, so those don't count. Whatever is collected will end up somewhere here in between. That's all I can say. I, can, I cannot say it will end up at a point. Okay, I can say convincingly that I can prove that all those rays that are collected by the lens will end up somewhere in there. And as a, for the non-imaging design, that's sufficient. Right? Because I don't care to form an image. I just want to get the energy. This is a one to many method. Right? One point here goes to many points on the receiver. That's not an issue. And this idea is very simple, but very powerful. Okay? And this idea is what's called an edge ray principle. So again, let's just reiterate. If the edge points E and F are imaged onto A and B, the edge points of the receiver, then all the rays from the intermediate points must pass in between A and B. Unnecessarily to a single point, it has to pass in between. All the rays that are collected, so just to be exact. The lens then acts as a concentrator. Of course, no image is formed. 
There is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the points on the object and those on the receiver. The key thing for us is a simpler design problem. Okay, that's good news. <coughs> These are important problems, so many good news to take. Or these are hard problems. Okay, now, so now we appreciate that. Now let's start thinking about re more realistic things. Okay, so the sun is not, doesn't look like this to you or me, or a solar, uh, or a solar concentrator. This is far away, right? really, really far away, almost infinite. Now, when you start taking these ray, this point and move it far, far, far away at infinity, then the rays basically all look like parallel bundle of rays. You don't, you don't see these. So do a thought experiment. Take a point. Okay, and it's emitting into the entire sphere. Okay, it's, it's emitting, right? All directions. Okay? And now imagine that sphere is getting larger and larger and larger and larger, right? And lights propagating. Imagine what it looks like over here. It's a huge sphere, right? Huge sphere. It will look like that. Or that. Right? It will look like a plane. You, can you visualize that? It's a huge, huge sphere, right? And a plane is nothing but a parallel bundle of rays. These are the rays. So you talked about this in the geometrical optics class. These are the wavefronts, these are the rays. Okay, so really to model the sun, we can even simplify the problem further by just thinking not just as spherical rays or rays going in all directions, we can just think of rays going in one direction, which highly simplifies our design problem. Of course, it's not always true. So let's think for a second. When is the situation when this is not true? Common sense, I guess. I'm talking about the sun. Right. Obviously, it's not true here, right? This this light obviously is going in all directions, right? You, 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 and by the way, the way to tell the light's going in, one, in all directions is very simple. Look at the shadow. That's fine. Is it sharp? No, probably it's not. Okay, if you go outside, if you look outside the window, look at the shadow from the, the frames of the window. They're sharp. Right, because the rays are coming in one direction. This shadow is not sharp because light's coming from all directions and illuminating under my hand. Okay. Now, so let's come back to my question. My question was, think about outside sun. When is this assumption not true? When does sun not form good shadows? No. Sorry? When the moon comes up. Well, when it's night, of course. But let's assume, let's say <laughs> the daytime, yes. The moon can come up in the day too. So that's the shadow. Sure, well, who cares? And the shadow is still there, sharp. So someone has said the answer. Did you? What did you someone said? Oh, yes, when it's cloudy. Right? So keep in mind that's the difference between direct sunlight, remember, and diffuse sunlight, where the light goes in all directions. So when it's cloudy, go and see if there's a shadow. You don't see a shadow, or it doesn't look so sharp. Okay. So, so I guess the, the key point I'm trying to make is the following. We are making a big assumption when we assume that the rays are straight, but it's a reasonable assumption because that's what most, you know, it depends on the location, of course, but if you think about Utah, for example, you get 300 days of direct sunshine a year, whatever, some, some huge number. So we're designed for that. <coughs> Just be aware that there's every, you know, the other 50 or 60 days where this doesn't happen. Okay, in any case, so let's come back to this. So instead of thinking about rays going in all directions, we think about rays coming from one or parallel bundle of rays. So in that situation, we can, if the source is large and really far away, we can define each point of the source to essentially give a parallel bundle of rays. Okay. Now, uh, if the source is tiny, if it only has one point, then you only need to deal with one bundle of rays. That's even next level of simplification. That's what I was talking about. 
But the sun is not that tiny, it's huge. Even if it's so far away, it still looks like a little disk, which means that we need to deal with its angular extent. Now, what does that mean? That means the following. If you look at the sun, it looks like a little disk, right? The light from the center of the disk, if you're sitting on the Earth, will, you know, follow some bundle of rays. But the light from the edge of the disk, disk will follow a slightly different angle in the bundle of rays. Okay, that's what I call the views. And this is small. Turns out to be about a half a degree. Small. Okay? Uh, but it becomes important when we start thinking about designing solar concentrators. At high concentration, as we will see. So this, that's what I mean by angular extent of, of the sun. So for example, the angular extent of something like this is huge. Like, it's emitting in all directions. Right? Something like this can be switched. So keep that in mind. So this is the, uh, the, the idea of thinking about angular extent. So this T2 is a bundle of rays coming from the bottom disk of the sun. Okay, also half a degree, let's say. And the rays D1 are coming from the top point disk of the sun. Okay? So all it means is that then all you have to do is to take the parallel rays uh, D1 uh, you have to ensure that they are focused onto the point edge point A of the receiver, and the parallel rays D2 are focused on the edge point B of the receiver. So that's point to point mapping. So one point at infinity is mapped to this point B, another point at infinity is mapped to this point A. Then the edge ray principle still applies. Anything in between, so any point like here, or here, or wherever, all we can say is that it will always end up in between B and A. Not necessarily at a single point, but it will spread between B and A. Same as the edge principle that we discussed before. OK? They're not focused to points. They need not be. OK, so before, uh, so uh, let's first of all, any questions before I move on to the somewhat related topic? Okay, if not, so it turns out, uh, <coughs> the ideal shape, which is able to take the bundle of rays, which are far away, which are parallel, and focus it to our receiver, is something called a compound parabolic concentrator. Okay, this is something that was realized in the 80s. And so we'll study this because this is a quintessential example of a non-imaging optic and it's very useful to think as a starting point. Okay, now we'll talk about this. So first, before I talk about it, let me show you a little video of one of these uh, uh, devices uh, which are commercial. These are commercially available. They're used, by the way, not just in solar concentrators. They're also used for... Um, um, They're also used for telecommunications, surprisingly. For example, when you have a fiber optic link, you want to connect to another fiber optic link, which has lots of fibers coming in, lots of fibers going out, you know, lots of phone calls or internet searches, or Facebook, whatever, uh, from one part of the country to the other part of the country. If there's a demultiplexing that happens, and fiber needs to talk to another fiber and all this business, that talking, of course, is light. Right? So they have to have ways of connecting one fiber to another fiber very efficiently. They use compound parabolic concentrators, very tiny versions of this. Okay, so it's not just in solar energy. So let's see what it is first. I don't, uh, maybe there's no... ...to collect and concentrate divergent light while avoiding well, the difficulties associated with multi-element system. I can't control the volume. If so, compound parabolic concentrators, known as C... Uh, Maybe the choice for you. A CPC <laughs> is a concentrator designed using a rotated parabolic shape. The wide end of the CPC collects divergent light, which is then reflected within the CPC and concentrated at the narrow output end. CPCs are defined using an acceptance angle, which is the angular range in which a CPC can collect light. 
CPCs are ideal for any application that requires the condensing of divergent light sources and are commonly used for solar energy collection, wireless communication, and biomedical and defense research. Okay, uh, do you want to turn it? Let me just go back to the mic first. So you can see the, the CPC, or compound parabolic concentrator, okay, the wide end collects the light, oops, and the narrow end is where you put the receiver, so you have concentration. Okay, so you saw that. Now what happens is in these devices is that light bounces around inside, and the shape is very carefully designed so that as much of the rays that come in end up at the bottom. So that's the goal. That's the goal we're trying to do. We're trying to collect as much as possible to the bottom, over as high of an acceptance angle as possible. So the acceptance angle is very important. We'll talk about that. OK, so you've seen the solution. Now let's think about how to come to that solution. So again, the design goal is very simple. As engineers, we're interested in this, right? We want to concentrate the incoming radiation to the maximum possible extent with the highest efficiency possible. That's it. Okay, pretty straightforward. So let's think about the radiation source. So we have a radiation source, rays coming in, edge rays here, R1, R2, at some angle, theta. You have some surface E1 here, and you have a which is where, let's say, we are going to define our first input aperture. And then we have some receiver at AB. Okay, it's exactly the same as what we talked about before, nothing new here. Now, I'm going to flip it down. So you're going to look at it vertically. Okay. So now my receiver is AB is at the bottom. Okay, that's my solar cell. That's it. I want to define. It's a reflective device, by the way, right? That we saw light is bouncing around inside. So I want to start defining mirrors to bounce the light. Okay. <coughs> so I put these mirrors A C1 and B D1. Now let's see what happens. Very simple. The ray R1 will bounce off the edge point of D1 and end up at A. That's my edge ray. Imagine, so again, keep in mind, the edge rays are this, right? This is the sun. This is my edge ray, coming from the farthest angle that I'm interested in. So I'm looking at one of those farthest angles, which is shown by this ray R1. OK? I want to ensure that ray ends up at an edge point of the receiver. Remember, that's the edge ray principle. By the way, the edge ray principle works whether you're using refractive lenses in transmission or reflective mirrors, as we will do the same. Okay. So I want to take an edge ray and make sure it goes to one of these points, A or B. In this case, I put a mirror there to ensure that it goes to A. Okay. Now, let's ask the question. Uh, first of all, the goal, uh, while we have the schematic up here, let's think about the goal. The goal is to ensure that the entrance aperture here, which is C1, D1, the top of the device, is as large as possible for a given exit aperture, AB. Okay, that, that's clear, right? You want to get as much collection as possible to for a given receiver. Now, let's ask the question. Now, I've defined an angle beta there. Okay, it's something arbitrary. You see the slope of the mirror B, D1. What would happen if I decreased beta? In other words, I made it more shallow. So if you imagine my arm is B, D1, and I made it shallower. What would happen? Yeah, like Area. No, 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 I haven't changed anything else. I'm doing exactly the same. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to redraw it here while you think. So this is my receiver, AB. That's my mirror. And it's symmetric, that's why I'm drawing the upside. Okay. And that's beta. This is the edge ray, R1. Come in here at some angle. Not, not so, the, the theta is not so important at this point. We'll come back to that. All I'm asking is, 
What happens if I take this mirror and just tilt it down? What happens? By the way, this is designed so it goes here. It will bounce off the other, the other over the other receiver and work out. Okay. So actually, I should ask you a good. This is a good practice problem example. So we're going to stop here for a minute. I want you to take out a piece of paper. I want you to draw the following thing. Tell me what given theta, and this, by the way, I can ask this for you in, in your in your in your exam. So you need to do this. This particular situation. Draw this. For a given theta, tell me what is beta. How would I select beta based on this given theta? The geometric problem. Then you can discuss. Not the exam. So I would encourage you. You get you three can discuss. But I would draw it first. By the way, in this class, you need to uh, be able to visualize. So it's important. That's a little bit unrelated to my question before. So I wanted to take a short break and think. I want you guys to think about this. The law of reflection and so on, right? You can discuss, it's fine. Not with it here. <laughs> question? Is it you asking? So am I, I'm asking a question is that the following. I give, let's say I've given you theta. Yeah. How would you calculate beta? How would you know what angle to place that mirror at? Is beta the side? Yes, yeah, beta is the same one. Yeah. Right here. Angle of the mirror. So this is, by the way, these little lines mean it's a mirror. Sorry. This is a mirror with a reflective surface on the other side. Okay, that's just a notation. It is this angle. So how, 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 yeah, how, what is this angle? Is that, is that clear? Yeah. So this we know, let's say, because it's from the sun. How would you figure out what this should be? That's a question you can discuss. This is geometric algebra that you should know. Anyone want to guess how would one would solve this? What should I do? Again, I've given you the incident ray is here. Okay, we know the incident ray, and I've also given you the reflective ray, also given. So, so this is a situation. In other words, this point is going to that point. So what would I do next? What if you extend the incident ray to the... Like that? Yeah. Okay. It's a good idea. But but before you do that, well, how what would I do? I mean... How would I apply the law of reflection? So let's again. The law of reflection. Would the incident angle be equal to the reflected angle? Exactly, yes. The incident angle should be equal to the reflected angle. Now, how would I define the incident angle? Tell me what the incident angle is in this situation. What you said is also very useful. We'll come to what you just said. But let's first define the unknowns first, or parameters first. How would I define the incident angle? In, in this situation, all you have to look is here. So the, you would expand the, uh, the mirror. OK, sure. I can expand the mirror. That's a good idea. And then you mark the, the normal. Exactly. And I have to know the normal to the mirror. Right? The normal to the mirror is what defines the incident angle. So I have to draw the normal. I'm going to erase some of these, which we will redraw later for clarity. I'm going to draw the normal to the mirror. Okay, that's 90 degrees. Now what is the angle of incidence? Not you, someone else. Well, what's the angle of incidence? Okay, 
What is the incident rate? Is that, right? It's coming in, that's the incident rate. So now what is the angle of incidence? The angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. That's the first law of reflection, but we have to know what those things mean first. So what is the angle of incidence? It is measured, so by the way, you should know this, so you should make sure you review this carefully. It is measured from the incident ray to the normal. Okay, is this angle. Theta in, that's the angle of incidence. Okay, in, in, in your class, I think you saw something like this. Right, you had a normal, you had light coming in, in this is theta n, correct? So something like this. It's exactly the same. I've just tilted it. And you need to be able to visualize this. It's very important. Now, what is the angle of reflection? Which was here. What is it over there? What is it over here? <coughs> No, I'm just saying, just, just show me on the on the geometry. Where will be, where, where is the reflected ray? That's the reflected ray, right? right? So the angle of reflection is measured by the angle between the reflected ray and the normal. Okay, it is this angle here. Okay, exactly the same as here, what you learned in your class, except that we have tilted this. Everything else is exactly the same. Okay? Is everyone clear on that? So, law of reflection says that this angle is equal to this angle. Okay? Now I'm going to put back the original angle theta that we had, which is here. Okay, now what would you do? So I know, I now know at least these two things. Now what, what would I do? I need to relate beta to theta, geometric, using your geometry. I'll let you spend about 30 seconds on that. You can, you can do it. This is high school geometry. It's not that simple, but you figure it out. Does anyone anyone know a quick way? Uh, I have to think here now. But you know, you gotta solve the geometry problem, basically. Um, let me think. So beta. It says 180 minus beta. And uh, I don't know if this is isosceles. Ah, yes. So I, I, I won't do the whole thing, but you can go through it later on at home. But this is basically 90 minus beta, right? because this is a 90 degree triangle. And then you have this theta known, this is theta n, theta reflection, plus this unknown here, plus this will give you 180 degrees. Okay, and then you can work out, because the fact that these two are equal, and you can show that uh, this line and this line intersect. So, yeah, let me see. Do I have it in my next slide? Oh, I don't. 
It's, I don't remember, but you guys can work it out. It's a geometry problem. I, I don't have time to go through it now. But let's come back to my old. But, but you need to be able to do this, by the way. So I, will, I could ask you things like this. You know, such a relatively simple geometry problems. I'm missing something here. I'm not visualizing it easily. Uh, if there is a simple solution to this, this, this might come into this moment. But the question I asked before, let's just step back a second, was you take this mirror and rotate it down, what happens? So let's draw that down. So I still have my receiver, AB. And I'm going to, originally I had this. Okay, I had the ray coming in. And this way. And let's say I just rotated it. That's my middle. Now, what happens to the ray? So instead of having here, I, I kind of bent it down. What will happen to this? This, what will happen to this reflected ray? Will it go up or down? It will bend up, right? It will go something like this, which means that it will miss A, right? It will go up. If it misses A, then you're lost. The H ray principle is gone. So there is a minimum beta. So by the way, why did I say I wanted to increase beta? Because the goal was to maximize the input aperture, which is this to this, right? So I want, was trying to make this large as possible. So there is a minimum where I can go. After which you've missed the rays. Yes. What does it still hit? Like your other reflector, though? And you can actually show it will leave. The system. Okay. But that's a good question. Yes. It will hit the other reflector, but you can show the system. Okay. So, how would I actually capture, how would I increase the aperture? Again, that's the goal, right? So, yes. so I had my receiver here. And let's say I figured out what my angle is. Beta. And it's symmetric, by the way. It's also beta. And if I wanted to increase this aperture, I can put more mirrors on top. Right? Because I cannot bend this anymore. So I cannot, because I want to make the C D as big as possible. So I could put another mirror. So I could put another mirror. Again, it's symmetric. So what did I call it? C1, C2. Okay. So now I have increased the aperture. C two D two is larger than C one D one. Right? I've increased the aperture. So then, what I need to ensure now is that, of course, let's draw what we already know: is that I know that this ray, R one, that I call, when it hits D one, must end up at a one edge ray. I have another edge ray now. Let's say it's D2, let's call it R2. They are parallel, because we are thinking of parallel, right, sun's so far away. This, what do I need this to do? But where should I send R2? <coughs> uh, to A, also. No. Well, I, I, yes, I can send it here, but I want to ensure it's an edge ray. You have to send it to the edge of the receiver. If I send it here, then there might be some rays which will miss in between. So you remember there are other rays in between that I've drawn. I'll show you in a second. But this is also an edge ray, right? Edge ray means it's all a bundle of rays coming from the edge of the sun. Okay? This edge ray also must go to the edge of the receiver. In other words, this ray must also end up here. Okay? Again, just to recap. The reason we're doing this is we want to increase the entrance aperture, and the reason we are only focusing on the edge rays going to the edge of the receiver is that if I had another ray, do you have another color? I just, yeah. 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 Easier to see. Is if you had another set of rays coming from another point of the sun, of course they will come at a smaller angle. Okay, so I'm going to draw them. 
smaller angle relative to the horizon. So I'm going to draw it like this. I want to ensure that these rays end up somewhere on the receiver. I don't care where, but somewhere on the receiver. Keep in mind, that's the goal. And the only way to reach that goal is to ensure that the edge rays, which are R1 and R2, end up at the edge point of the receiver. That's the edge ray fusion. Okay. So, the solution here is to add one more mirror. Now, if you think about it, again, I have to, I can think again, how do I maximize the edge of the again? How do I increase it to be two again? What would I do? Yes. You go add more mirrors. No limit, right? There is a limit. But you can add more mirrors. So go ahead, yeah. Um, so is B2 smaller than B1? Sorry, uh, beta. No, no. That's a very good question. That's why I wanted to be able to work out this. And I don't remember, so you guys should work it out. But you can see, it's looking at the picture, that it's not. You have to bend more. Right? You can, you can kind of see it. This is a visualization that I was talking about. This ray needs to come here, or this ray needs to come here. Which is bending more? R1 or R2? Now, what do I mean by bending more? So, when I say bending more, is you can think about this angle. So, as you go up, you need to bend more. Right? In other words, it's kind of hard to see the way I've drawn it. But this needs to go at a sharper angle to reach the same point. So the farther I go, the higher I go, I need to, uh, wait, no, I'm, I'm wrong. <laughs> I have to think here. Am I? No, I'm wrong, yes. So what I mean, ignore what I just said for a few seconds. The, shall, the, the lower the angle is, I need to bend more. So the higher I go, I have to bend less, right? Imagine a situation where I have a ray way up here, right? I need to bend less to reach this. So there is a limit, right? We'll, we'll come to that, problem. yes, exactly. There is a limit, absolutely. But you can see that the answer to your question is that this has to tilt a little bit this way, which you can kind of see in the, in the diagram. Okay, and that's why, by the way, uh, you should come up with a relation of beta and theta, and then you will see how it changes. Uh, and you will notice that the relation between beta and theta depends upon how high it is. Yeah? Is there a difference then if, since those are just um, different segments, if the images are getting a bit more spherical? Yes, very good. We're going to come to that. It's exactly what we will do. But that's a good, good intuition. That's exactly what needs to happen because, of course, you don't want to make little segments, right? That would be expensive, hard, break, and what happens at the edges, break, or whatever. Okay, so you keep going, you make it continuous. Exactly what you said. <coughs> right? there, by the way, this thing I select is arbitrary. I can make it arbitrarily small, right? If I make it small, just the whole thing becomes a curve instead of being little segments. And that curve turns out to be a parabola. Okay, you can prove this. So you keep adding mirrors, keep going up and up. Uh, assuming each of these mirrors are infinitesimally small, this becomes a curve, um, a reflective surface. And it turns out it's a parabola. Now, before we explain why it's a parabola, Let's think about the symmetry. There's always a symmetry along the vertical axis. It's a mirror symmetry. In other words, what's on the right-hand side of this vertical line is exactly the same as what's on the left, and left, left side, mirror, reflected in the mirror. Okay, and that will help us do our analysis faster. Um, 
So the way, of course, you define this curve is exactly how we drew this thing by minimizing beta, right, and to maximize the aperture. So in this case, of course, now beta is a function of each point here. So you want to minimize beta for each point, ensuring that every ray that hits that point ends up at, a, at the edge point of the receiver. Okay, exactly what we discussed, but now in a continuous surface. Uh, so it's the curve that produces the smallest beta and, the, and, and hence the largest entrance aperture C3D3. <coughs> and the sends out to be a parabola. So let's think about what that means. So I'm going to take this, ignore this in your mind. Okay, just think about this point, A, B, and this curve. Okay? I'm going to take this thing, I'm going to extend it down, and I'm going to rotate it like this. So take this curve, rotate it down. Okay? You will see this. So, take this curve, and all the rays, just rotate it down. You will see this. This is the same curve. These are the same rays. Okay? And that's a parabola. Now, the definition of a parabola is that all the rays, so it's, by the way, this is a parabola, that's the axis of the parabola. All the rays that come, that are parallel to the axis of the parabola, end up at its focus. That's the definition of a parabola. Okay, and I assume you guys have done it in high school geometry, whatever, in class like that. Okay. Now, from our point of view, uh, so let's make sure. So all the edge rays, which are these rays, must get reflected to the edge point of the receiver. Remember, I rotated everything, so now my receiver is like that. I rotated everything 90 degrees. In the previous slide, again, visualization, my receiver is here. I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees like that, which is here. Okay, so the edge rays now have reflected the edge point of the receiver. Ignore the other stuff, not so important, the other stuff. Okay. So again, the, the dashed line on top there can be thought of as this wavefront coming in to the parabola. Okay, and it gets focused, this edge point. Okay. Now, the CPC itself is composed of segments of two parabolas. Double A, I guess. So, this is one of them, which is what we focused on. But you have a completely, exactly mirror symmetric one on the other side. And it's a segment because I'm slicing off all this dash part, I'm ignoring all the dash part here. I'm only looking at the solid line. Okay? So let's go back for a second. That's the parabola. Okay? I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees again, go back to our original picture, and I'm going to slice off everything from one of these edge points and ignore it. And that's what happens here. Okay, so the solid line is the parabola. The edge rays come in to the focus of the first parabola, which is A. The focus of the other parabola is the other edge point, it's mirror symmetric. Okay? So this is simple, but you have to visualize it. It's the important thing. So the key things to think about here, the most important things from our point of view, is the receiver size, source cell, whatever, D2, and the entrance aperture D1 at the top there. That's how much I'm going to collect. And the geometric concentration is the area of the collection area divided by area of the receiver part. That's how much I've concentrated the light. Okay, so that's the important thing I'm going to think about, or we are going to think about in terms of design. The other stuff are kind of detail you need to know. Um, 
um, the axis of the parabola, for example, this represents the the, uh, the edge ray. Right? This is one axis of this parabola, the edge ray. By the way, I forgot to say that the edge there's one edge ray that comes here, right, tied to this edge point. I can draw many rays that are parallel. Let's ignore the red lines for now. It's too many lines are confusing. Actually, that's right. So if I have, I have many of these edge rays, right? I have one that goes straight to this edge point also. Okay, I have a bundle of rays, right? Okay. Now, uh, so that axis, this line here is the axis of this parabola. And that defines the edge ray of the sun. That's how we find another way to think about drawing the seats. Uh, let's see, what else? The other important parameter, we will go, we'll come back to this, so don't worry about too much, but the acceptance angle drawn there, theta accept, which is basically the range of angles that you're able to collect with high efficiency. Right? It's not infinite, there's a range. Right? We drew R1 and R2. Right? I didn't draw all two. I mean, sorry, I didn't draw <coughs> not, not these. There's a symmetric set of rays on, on this side, right? So the collection angle goes from one set of angles over here to another set of angles. So that spans hopefully what you need to do in terms of collecting light from the sun or whatever. Okay. So I want you to be able to visualize that. That's the important thing. Now, uh, what, what Jen said, if you keep extending the parabola, keep going up and up, it'll start bending in, right? So, in other words, it's easier to see here. If I start increasing that, it'll start bending in, inwards, right? And at some point, it'll start shadowing. So it'll reduce my entrance out. So there is a maximum where I want to stop. That gives me the maximum entrance aperture for a given exit aperture. In other words, that gives me the maximum concentration. So, so C4, D4, for example, is less than CD, but I want to stop at CD. That gives me the maximum concentration. So by the way, that's where you saw in those videos that they can chop off. That's that maximum. Yeah. And this is all for a fixed light source, right? It's yes, exactly is. right. Yes. So it is for a particular location of the sun, which means that we'll come to that, we have to track the sun. The whole thing either has to move, or there's another option, is you define, design the system such that the acceptance angle is large enough that as the sun moves, it still collects. It's another option. You don't have to track the sun. We'll talk about both situations. And I think some project, one, one of your teams are looking at solar concentrators, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So hopefully you're looking at interesting solutions. There's lots and lots of research, lots of really fun things happening in this space. Lots of clever people thinking about this. Maybe also heliostats. I don't know. Do you know what a heliostat is? Okay, you guys need to start doing some research. That's another alternative for solar concentration. Who's on your team, by the way, looking at you? But okay, make sure you do some research. Okay, so uh, the last concept, uh, again, just to drive home, is this idea of the edge ray principle. This is what we've been talking about in the whole class. But if you want to take that particular idea, uh, just to codify it, the light rays coming from the edges of the source must be deflected refracted or reflected or whatever, somehow bent onto the edges of the receiver. This is a basic design principle of non-imaging concentrators. So again, just from a visualization point of view, here is the physique. If you have an edge ray at an angle theta one, theta, sorry, that's the acceptance angle, it will end up at the edge point of the receiver. Now, if I have a ray that has coming at an angle that's larger than theta, outside my acceptance, uh, sorry, this is inside my acceptance, so less, smaller than theta, that means it'll end up somewhere in between. Right? It'll be on the receiver, but somewhere in between, I don't know exactly where, but somewhere in between. 
But on the other hand, if I have a ray that's outside the acceptance angle, it will not reach the receiver. To bounce around and escape the system. I mean, what I drew there may not be exactly correct, but something like that. So all rays entering the CPC with an input angle less than the acceptance angle are trapped and will end up at the receiver with 100% efficiency, theoretically. That's why the CPC is important. But all rays entering the CPC with input angle greater than theta are lost. They basically get reflected out of the system. By the way, the efficiency is determined by what? We didn't talk about it, but it's important. What's happening to the light? In this case, let's just take this example. It's reflecting off one surface, right, and ending up at the receiver. That reflection, theoretically, is 100% efficient, but in practice, not. You have some reflectivity, right? A mirror was 99.99% efficient, maybe. You have 0.01% loss there. You have some loss, and this becomes important if you have rays that are bouncing around a lot. So if a ray bounces around a million times, you might lose a lot of energy. So you have to be careful with that also. One way to solve this problem is to use total internal reflection. Which you also talked about in geometric graphics, I assume. Total internal reflection can be 100% efficient. Which is why, in the video that you saw, this thing was not empty. This wasn't air. This was glass. And the reflection happens because of TIR, total internal reflection, because you're going from a high index glass to low index air. That's why they use. A solid piece of glass or plastic or something, not hollow, like we are drawing. Okay, and that has other implications as well. We'll talk about that uh, in the next class. But we'll end, it, end, end here, basically defining the fundamental property of the of the CPC is something called an acceptance or efficiency of acceptance. Theoretical CPC, it's hundred percent for all angles until it reaches the acceptance angle. Beyond that, zero. So sharp. Okay, you, if you if you plot the acceptance, it basically looks like a step function, right? Theta, zero. Say, let's say theta. This is the acceptance angle, and this is the efficiency. It's one hundred percent, and then zero. Okay. In the real CPC is not like that. Uh, oh, it's a half acceptance angle because half because you measure from the normal, you measure on both sides, right? You, you understand that you measure. Uh, we'll stop here. Let's see, uh, what is the next thing? Uh, yes, we'll stop here because the, we need to. So we need to spend a little bit of time understanding uh, how the concentration factor is calculated. So that's an important point, right? Because you want to concentrate as much as possible sometimes. So we need to get an understanding of how that concentration factor affects the design of the CPC and how it affects the acceptance angle. And we will come to an interesting conclusion that if I try to concentrate more, I need to track more precisely. In other words, my acceptance angle will start going down. And this turns out to be a, con a, a consequence of the second law of thermodynamics, which is very interesting in itself. Something very fundamental in physics, which is affecting something very practical at the time. I will stop here. Okay, so uh, are there any questions for me? I'm, I can answer questions now. If you...